So the reason I want to talk about the program evaluation is because this is something that has to occur before you can submit your reports, before you can submit your summative evaluation. This is a very important part of the program is this evaluation piece. All right. Um, the regulation says that you've got to have policies and procedures for all of the um, sections of the regulation, right? Oftentimes people have policies, but they don't necessarily have procedures. Uh, remember that procedures are step by step instructions about how something will be, how, how the policy will be carried out. Often it includes who's going to be responsible, the time frame, um, mainly the directions of how something's going to occur. So if you don't have any procedures for your program evaluation, this is a good time. Uh, good time of year to um, think about how those occur and write them down, uh, have them, uh, you know, be reviewed by someone in your, your district and then submit those to be reviewed by your local board because we have to have local, um, our policies and procedures have to be approved by our local board and they have to be available for public ins inspection. A good place to have that is on your district web page. Uh, if you're looking for that available for public inspection place. All right, so we're going to uh, go through these different uh, pieces of the program evaluation. Um, and just make sure as you go through your program evaluation that you document this. Um, and it complies with the retention scale. I don't remember offhand how, off, how long you have to keep uh, your notes from your program evaluation, that's something I'll need to look up. All right, um, also remember that uh, with your program evaluation, the data that's collected in the annual program has to be uh, utilized in a school and district instructional planning process. Many people's policies say that it'll be presented or shared with their site-based decision-making council or councils and with their local board. So look at your policy, see if that's what it says, because you'll want to make sure that you incorporate that into your program evaluation procedures. Uh, and again, just make sure that agendas, meeting minutes, slide decks, um, all of that is saved uh, as documentation. Um, and also those are the types of things that I'll be looking for for in a monitoring visit. Okay. So one of the first things that's talked about in the program evaluation and the regulation is overall student progress. So what is overall student progress? And this year I would ask you to kind of kill two birds with one stone and to, as you look at your student progress, to really look at those progress reports that, you've, that you're going to be sending home um, at the end of each semester. Um, so lost my train of thought there, sorry. Um, yeah, look at your uh, progress from your reports because I'm going to be asking you in the summative evaluation. I thought about this long and hard. Um, the regulation kind of jumping tracks here a little bit, but the summative evaluation asks for you to report, uh, to give a report of a summative evaluation and a report of progress. And this has been a, an unusual year. I know that there's lots of different ways that you can collect uh, progress on students, but in order for us to all kind of be on the same page, I thought it would be best for us to look at our progress reports. So please look at your progress reports and be thinking about, um, you know, how you can look at the overall way students progress this year. Um, I'm going to be asking, you know, questions like um, uh, kind of a multiple choice question about did they meet? Did they not meet? Uh, did they exceed? And so you'll want to go back and look at your progress reports. And of course, you'll have to wait a little bit longer because some of those progress reports come out uh, a little later in the year. But um, look at those progress reports and in some manner tally up, you know, how did they mostly do, right? You're not going to have to give me numbers or anything like that, that you had 100 students that met 100 students that didn't meet and five students that exceeded that kind of thing. You're just going to be look, looking at your uh, data and giving a general overall statement. 
and those statements will be for grade levels four and five and a, uh, you know an overall statement for students in six through eight and then again for students in nine through twelve so um, but i know that there's different ways like i said to collect that that information uh, oftentimes people will look at that information from their um, district diagnostic assessments and um, it's important to collect that information analyze that information um, talk about with your administrator or with your selection and placement committees or your advisory committees that you may organize and as you do that make sure that you document all of those conversations and any materials that you use um, to discuss those information all right the next part of the program uh, evaluation is uh, student parent and faculty attitudes toward the program so um, again this should be part of your district procedures to collect how you're going to collect feedback from students and parents and faculty about the gt program again the next steps would be to analyze that feedback because that's going to be important in another part of your uh, program evaluation which is uh, future um, you know modifications and then future planning and so all of the things that you're collecting are helping you move towards uh, discussions about modifications or future plans um, you know and in the past if your district has not received much feedback uh, you might want to try reaching out to someone in the stakeholder group like a parent you know to ask how that process might be improved uh, you might try multiple ways to survey state stakeholders you know this might include a, a parent meeting where the survey is given and participants take the survey at the meeting because um, sometimes you know when we send out emails to parents or we send a, a note home in a student's backpack sometimes it gets lost or forgotten so having people right there at the time to complete the survey maybe that might be the what the best way to um, to survey people to get those results that, that you're looking to analyze um, and don't forget to, to uh, save those um, to save the analyzation of the feedback because that's all an important part of the process community involvement so what is community involvement so community involvement can define it in several different ways um, this is how the gt program is involved in the community uh, for example you might have uh, students who have uh, had a food drive this year or they've collected uh, cans to give to people in need uh, you know cans of food for people in uh, need it can be students who are involved in the community theater uh, don't think that that's really gone on very much this year due to you know social distancing and whatnot um, uh, and then how the community is involved in the in the program you know you may have a community member who comes and gives a seminar or gives a, a presentation about something that they are involved in and um, you know something else that i think is part of uh, community involvement is also like i talked about before when you go to give information to, to parents and to staff and faculty you know if you're going out in the community maybe you're meeting at a church maybe you're meeting at a community activity center to give out information about the program that's also another part of community involvement right um, so just remember for program evaluation there needs to be a discussion you know with notes taken and saved about community involvement and uh, also save things like flyers for the different types of activities you've got going on pictures invitations newspaper articles these are all good artifacts to save for that uh, piece of the program evaluation cost effectiveness so what is cost effectiveness this is how money from the gt state grant is spent and how other funds have been expended on the gt program uh, there are many districts who um, you know subsidize their gt grant because a gt grant grant can't pay for all the things that they need for their program um, and this is also you know meeting in discussions about you know how funds were spent and needs for future funds right and your data that you've collected from these other areas will help support you know any you know cost needs that you, that you have um, so it's important to keep um, like I said, document all of your conversations and these uh, the, the data that you have from your um, stakeholders and from um, you know your surveys from parents and staff. 
The next one is the incorporation of the gifted education into the regular school program. Well, that's a mouthful, isn't it? All right, so this item um, should be discussed and presented about how uh, gifted education is part of the regular school program. You know, your discussion or presentation, it could in, uh, include, uh, you know, how many students are part of the program, what types of services are provided, um, who's providing the services, what kind of models being used to provide the services. Uh, there can be a discussion of enrichment, acceleration. Um, you know, this is, you know, how how is gifted education part of the, the school program? So, you know, you, sh you should, should, there should be a discussion of this with your supervisor or your selection and placement committee. And these notes need to be taken about how this this takes how this is a part of your program evaluation in order for um, for this to be um, documented. Overall quality of instruction and program personnel credentials. All right, so in this part of the evaluation, um, there needs to be a review of the GT staff and the regular education staff credentials. You know, your discussions, you know, may include, you know, who's certified to teach gifted and talented. Uh, do we need an additional uh, staff hired to meet the needs of our students? Um, you know, um, and then, you know, pairing of, of needs of students to staff. You know, who could we, you know, if you're doing maybe a mentoring program or just uh, some clubs or those types of things, you know, what kind of needs and are there staff that can are uh, hired that can meet those needs? Next is future program and directions and modification. So, you know, once all the program evaluations gathered, right? Uh, the GT coordinator could meet with the supervisors. They could meet with building administrators, uh, with the placement committee or an advisory committee, you know, to write up based on all the data that you've collected, um, you know, a future program directions and modifications. Or even if you don't write up a narrative or whatever, the, the, the discussion needs to be captured. You know, what are the um, future directions? What are the modifications that might need to be uh, made? And then, we're going to talk about this uh, as well. Uh, it needs to be shared with school staff and with district staff, and that needs to be captured that that was done. Uh, that needs to be documented. And like I said before, sometimes this is done uh, with SBDM, site-based decision-making councils, and some policies say the local board. So important to, uh, to move forward with uh, discussions and then also important to um, document. All right, the regulation states that data collected in the annual program evaluation shall be utilized in the school and district instructional planning process. And so um, you've, you've collected lots of different data, and so uh, this needs to be somehow or another used as instruction is being planned for the for the coming school year, uh, this might be it might might look like um, that the future plans and modifications based on the data is part of the uh, continuous school improvement plan and the continuous district improvement plan. Um, however, your district decides to do that, it needs to be a part of that that planning process. Uh, it, it may be that you meet with a team of people from building administrators and or uh, district administrators to talk about, you know, instructional planning. And however your process and procedures outline that, uh, please document that for um, uh, monitoring purposes as well as historical purposes that that took place. You could use agendas, you know, meeting notes, and also your CSIPs and CDIPs as documentation. All right, again, Miss Hannah, I have talked a lot. I'm trying to move quickly because there's still more information to cover. Do we have any questions? Yes, Miss Kathy, we have one uh, from, from Kim Sumner. She had asked, can MAP and CERT CERT assessments be used to determine overall student progress? How do we determine this for leadership, the arts, and creativity? So, um, 
yes, map and cert can be looked at because they're diagnostic tools that the can be used to look at progress. Uh, remember, I said for progress reporting to the state, though this year we're going to be looking at our progress reports. And then the second part of that question, can you say that one again for me, Hannah? Yes, uh, she wanted to know how we can do this or determine this for the leadership, visual performing arts, and creativity. So I would say that your progress reports are the best way to do that, that as you meet with the, with the staff that uh, probably provide services for those students, uh, either through professional learning communities or with uh, meetings you set up with those staff, um, or if you yourself are providing those services, uh, that you're documenting that into the progress report about how that student is 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 uh, growing for those non state assessed areas. Also, Miss Angie Henderson has graciously um, volunteered to send you a copy of rubrics that we were wondering if possibly you would care to share these on the GT resource webpage and or email them out to everyone in your GT server email list. Yes, that's great. That would be great. Angie, send those on. And that's all we have. Okay.